Well, Glory, good morning. We've got to stop meeting this way, you know. This is our second Sunday of being separate from one another. But I want to tell you, in Christ, we're united. We're one. Father, as I was just uh, having a bit of a time of worship just before opening up the video, I was playing a collection of hymns, which I sought to put on the uh, tape uh, a few days ago and had to had to take it off because of the length. But um, uh, the first song on that is uh, Jesus Paid It All. <laughs> all to him I all to him I freely give. Wow. It's amazing what he did for us. We know what we deserve. Oh, but to get the riches of heaven at Christ's expense. He did indeed pay it all. I remember the cross at Calvary. The second song in that medley, the old rugged cross, the rich treasure in that song. And then beneath the cross, beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. You know, not long from now, who knows just when only God, but not long from now, <laughs> we'll have the privilege and it'll be so sweet having been deprived for a time. We'll no longer take it for granted. It's a wonderful country that we live in, but I know you are mindful and want to remember there are over 2,200 Americans who have given their lives to the scourge of this virus right now. And while God allows that this event is taking place in our lives, we pray for those families. We pray for them bereaved of their loved ones. Some went on quite ready to go to glory. Other not so much so. And isn't that the very reason for which we're still here is to carry a witness and a testimony to the world. God would have you and I to vocalize that testimony when necessary. <laughs> there are times when simply living it with great energy and enthusiasm is all it takes. But more often than not, we need to speak a word of testimony. Tony Evans says, you remember, Holy Spirit in you is going nuts to talk about Jesus. Wow. Well, we could get on that page in agreement with him. This morning we'll be taking a look in just a few minutes at a passage in Galatians chapter 3. When Paul was writing his whole letter to that church to encourage them to realize it's Jesus Christ and him alone, him crucified, that is the subject of our salvation. Not Jesus plus anything else. <laughs> you can't add and you better not be trying to take away from the finished work of Christ at the cross for your salvation and for mine. <laughs> That's how I'm saved. It's how you're saved. If we're saved at all, it's by grace through faith. But that's not of ourselves according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's a gift. It's a gift he wants to freely give to each and every person. And he'll use us to proffer that gift if we'll let him. May we do so. May we pray. Our Father, we thank you and praise you for this privilege, this precious time that we have together this morning. And I pray that you might speak to our hearts yet again out of Paul's teaching to the church at Galatia. They were dealing with those who wanted to add to the finished work of Christ at the cross. And Father, we may be prone to do that from time to time ourselves. Sometimes we're duped into it, lapse over into a pattern that as much as communicates that, we want to be true to your word. We want to be ever praising Jesus that he loved us enough to come to earth and die for our sin. And having gone back to glory and preparing a place, we're looking forward to a day 
When he comes back in the same manner as his disciples saw him go, when he ascended into the clouds, Father, you've made it plain that there'll be a day when he comes back. And we don't know if we'll survive to see that day literally, physically, or if somehow you'll call us home in an earlier manner. And we know that the virus has already taken uh, 2,200 lives. We lift those families to you and pray by your Holy Spirit that you're present and real to them as Lord and Savior. And if not, that we would be faithful to share when we can and when we will that Jesus is Lord and that he is uh, the rewarder of those who seek him. Father, help us to help them to know you in that saving way. Now bless a time of reading of your scripture and then expanding upon that, expounding upon that. May it be a blessing to the hearer. May it indeed be a blessing to the author. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The finish of our faith, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I invited you to turn with me to the book of Galatians, and we are uh, still in chapter 3, just about to finish up today. We'll be beginning our reading in uh, verse 23 of that chapter. And uh, as you're finding that, I uh, Hope and pray that you've got your own copy of the scripture with you. You know Baptists uh, check out their preacher and keep him honest and straight. And so as you're doing that today, you see there that uh, uh, that the scripture says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come. We are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither... Uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. <laughs> I guess you can tell in this light and uh, that I'm having some difficulty seeing my Bible. I apologize for the conditions. I am preaching from my home and my living room. and uh, But in any case, uh, God is still on the throne. He's still good. Amen. We're looking this morning and considering the topic. Are we under the law or are we in Christ? And I want to tell you, uh, there's, there's, there's a need for you and I to be saved in Christ. The, before we believed, God's law did two things for us, according to this passage of scripture. He's saying you were jailed or imprisoned uh, with us when he says you were kept under the law. And so that expression or that phrase that he's given implies that you were in prison. You were shut up under penalty of the law. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been fortunate enough, not that I haven't ever done anything I could have been locked up for, but I've never have been behind bars other than to go as a chaplain while I was in seminary. I did that for a number of years and shared the gospel with folks behind bars. Well, I want to tell you, <laughs> just like the Philippian jailer got saved as a result of what happened with Paul and Silas, in the lower rungs of the jail, people in jail come to Christ. You know why they come to Christ? Well, the first time many of them figure out, oh my goodness, I've got a problem <laughs> with who I am and what I do. I need to straighten up. I need to fly right. I need to fly to glory when I die. And the only way to do that, if you're telling the truth, 
is to embrace Jesus. You'd be surprised how many who find themselves in a jail decide that it's time to do right. In fact, as a matter of when we were under the law, when we were jailed, when we were imprisoned to our own sins and the penalty of it, that was a perfect opportunity for us to come to the realization, I need to do different. I need to be different. And I've tried, but I can't. But I understand that the King of glory who died on the cross for me can come to live in my life, to forgive me of my sin, and to take over, and to take me out of this hellhole of a prison life that I've been living and walking in, to take me to glory when I die, but not only to get to glory, but to live abundant life right here on earth. So before I came to Christ, I was jailed under the law and the penalty for having broken it. Well, the law became our tutor or our guardian, Paul says. That's the second thing he wanted to say to them. You were jailed or imprisoned to your own sins, but then came the law through Moses, and the giving of it became our tutor or our guardian. Wow. He escorted us uh, to school and kept us at home and disciplined us. So we'll talk about all of that. Well, let's look and focus a little more thoroughly on being kept in custody under the law or in jail or in prison, if you will. Continually, we were in violation of the law and we became death row offenders, charged as habitual violators. Now, I know that I've had some habits in my life that clearly violate the standards of God's word, but I've not violated or lived in such a manner that I wound up literally physically locked up behind bars, but spiritually I was bound by my sins and by the penalties of it. I don't know if you've ever heard of being a habitual violator before, but in the state of Georgia, you can get classified as a habitual violator for breaking certain laws on the roads of the land. And you can use your, lose your right to even be on the road. Oh, you might be able to get an exception to drive, at least to drive for work. But if you violate one more time, you can lose that law outright and have difficulty. So uh, some of the times I think we live in such a way and so consistently under a cloud of sin that we truly should be classified, at least in spiritual terms, as habitual violators. They're just things that we quite seemingly naturally do in our old self, in our old man, that just violate the word, that violate the standards of God's law. You see, in Jewish life, in the life of a young boy from the ages of about six to up to about 16 uh, from the time of Moses uh, the demands of keeping the law was upon them and even though you might be a conscientious Jew with a, a, a love for God and wanting to pursue him you would be very much aware and under the guilt of realizing I know what the law says but I don't see myself living up to it why it seems impossible. Even though I'm sincerely loving the Lord and wanting to do the right thing, I've got a clear sense as well of guiltiness, of being guilty before the law and before the courts. This guilt that we have and they had as Jews is a guilt. It's like a, a divine warning system that says, blow the buzzer on you, you're messing up, you're stepping out, you're in violation of the love of God and the law of God, the standard of his uh, moral standards on our life, and, 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 and you're destroying your own soul by living in such a matter. You're ignoring the warnings. I've noticed that if I ignore the warning bell on my truck, it says low fuel, 
that sooner or later I'll slap run out of gas. E does not stand for enough, and my efforts will never be enough. Though I may genuinely have a love and an affectionate thought towards heaven and the things of God and towards God himself, my efforts will never get me there. Uh, they never will get me there. They never would get the Jew there, no matter how genuine and sincere his uh, efforts might have been. In truth of the matter, if you ignore the warning, the results may be bad, and that bad result may be for eternity. Can I go back and change that word from may to will? If you ignore the warnings and the penalty that's uh, given and understood for our sin, then there will be a bad outcome. And it will be an outcome that we would pay the price for eternity. You remember that Romans, obviously a New Testament passage, but it makes it plain, Old Testament or New, that the wages, the payday for sin is death. I don't know about you, but when I work, there's always the pleasant thought, at least, though the work may be difficult, that in the end, there will be a payday, a, a, a decent a wage for a decent day's labor. And that wage, is, as it relates to sin, is death. And uh, that's a death by execution. They put you to death. Well, the law was never a substitute uh, for, um, for faith. And it was never intended to be a barrier to faith. Just the opposite. A Jew could be saved by faith just as Abraham was when he believed God, as Moses was when he walked by faith with God. They looked ahead to the time of Jesus and what he would do for us all at the cross we look back to the time of Jesus and what he did for us at Calvary, and we sing the song in celebration as if we know and understand to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Well, I remember a fellow named Peter who said he would bear the reproach and the shame, but he couldn't even handle getting arrested. He, he, he bailed. He was afraid of paying that price. Well, I'm going to tell you, Jesus has paid the price for us. Now, the Jews in this business of keeping the law, they came to understand that they were guilty. They had a sense of it in their heart and life. And they developed a whole set of traditions and rituals that they sought to keep because it was seemingly easier to keep what they devised than to keep the righteous standards of the law. And what they were saying was, we can do this. We, the, they thought that they could keep those traditions and those rituals. And thereby attained righteousness of God. But that was not so. In fact, when you come to the Sermon on the Mount and you begin to read there some of the verses beginning in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, you realize that he's essentially saying to them, oh, you think you can keep it, eh? Well, you've heard it said, and he would give them an illustration uh, from the Old Testament, and particularly from Exodus chapter 20. You've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you, when you're angry, <laughs> to wish your brother gone or to wish some ill upon him, you've committed murder in your heart. And if you don't check it <laughs> before it outs, before it takes some action, you harm your brother in a literal, physical way. Same was true with adultery and a number of other sins. He went on from verse 17 of chapter 5 to verse 31, talking about different illustrations. You've heard it said, but I tell you, he was taking it well past what the law said for them to understand the spirit of the law <laughs> was for you to recognize, oh my goodness, I can't seem to do right. 
I can't seem to keep up with honoring God as the Lord and Savior of my life. Uh, I, I, I can't pull it off. I can't keep the laws in my own strength. I need to trust God. I need to place my faith in him. Bingo. That's exactly what God had in mind was for you to come to a realization. I am lost and undone. Try as I might. I can't live up to the standard. I cannot keep this. I need a savior. A man only comes to know he needs a savior when he first realizes I can't do this. I'm humbled by the fact that I'm just a sinner in need of a savior. And I call on the one that the scripture says died for exactly that purpose for me. Paul said, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They did not know of God's righteousness and seeking to establish a righteousness of their own. They did not subject, subject themselves to the righteousness of God. You see, man has always had a tendency to somehow want to pull it off on his own. And I know that this whole notion in our culture, American culture, especially of being a self-made man, self-made man, baloney. It doesn't exist spiritually. You're going to have to come to a place where you acknowledge, I can't do this. I need Jesus who's done it for me. To take, who took the penalty for my sin on the cross. I need him to come and take over to be the Savior and the Lord of my life. You may remember a fellow back yonder in the Old Testament who sought to get it done by his own manner and circumstance and measure. A fellow named Cain who brought a veggie offering to the Lord, who uh, brought that offering. But you know what they say about turnips? You can't get blood out of the turnip. God had already set the standard and the pattern and the picture and the representation that it was going to take a life blood offering in order to cover the sin of man. He did that with the slaying of an animal in order to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. And from that beginning, there's been a picture of a blood offering. And uh, his brother Abel understood this. No doubt his mom and dad had given them instruction. But Cain didn't like that. And when God rejected in them his offering, oh man, did that ever make him mad and insulted. That he had put forth uh, labor and had grown those beautiful vegetables and brought them and why couldn't God just be satisfied with that? Well, you, you let me ha know how that turns out. If indeed you appear before the judgment seat, the great white throne, and you're required to give an account of yourself and you say to him, but I went to church every Sunday and I made an offering and I did this or that. I treated other people in a similar fashion to the way I thought I might like to be treated. I was basically a good person. Well, I want to tell you, good people finish last in the kingdom of God. It's the one who acknowledges the truth of what Jesus said about it. There's only one good and that's God. Now, we understand that Jesus was God, and he could surely say that, and did, and that's the standard. But the goodness he speaks of is not going to church and giving an offering ever so often, or even being a, a decent fellow to others. It's perfect goodness. I don't have it in me, and neither do you have it in you. And so he's looking and saying, we were kept under the law. Pride in a man will not yield to do it God's way, but saving grace requires that you humble yourself. Have you humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God? Confess that you couldn't pull it off, but you understand he did and ask him to do it for you. Ask him to be Lord. Paul had a problem with pride. You remember he was very 
very proud of the fact that he was a Hebrew, that he was a Pharisee. I mean, he said, <laughs> as far as that goes, I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees. You couldn't hardly meet a finer fellow as it relates to that. Why I was circumcised on the eighth day, the exact day that the Father called for. Well, he called for that because he knew the clotting factor in the blood was maximized by that date or on that date. But it wasn't a, a, a saving grace. It was a it was a identification that the Jews took with the kingdom of God. He said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. As, as to zeal, oh man, it doesn't get any better than I. The zeal, I was so zealous for the Father and for his church and the temple that I persecuted the church. And yet he says, I threw it all on the dung heap. I look back and realize that all my self-efforts were as filthy rags. And what ought you to do with a rag that's been used up? You throw it on the dumb pile compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ as Jesus, my Lord. <laughs> there isn't anything better than all that stuff I used to think was so great. I now look and realize it was worthless as far as commending me to God. I was kept in custody under the law until such time as I trusted by faith in Jesus Christ. For him, it happened on the Damascus Road. For me, it happened in the choir at First Baptist Church Thompson. Where did it happen for you that you came to the end of yourself and the beginning of faith in God where you said, I can't do this. You never said I could. Jesus did, and he will do it in my life to bring salvation. Well, he says the law has become a tutor. He expressed this in verse uh, 24, I believe it was. Uh, yeah, he says, therefore the law has become our tutor. Why? Because I was shut up in custody. I was in jail, and the law revealed that, that I, I, I was imprisoned by my own sin but the law has become our tutor to lead us to christ i mentioned a while ago that a young boy in the jewish uh, household would be uh, raised by a tutor a slave or a servant who came alongside to help that young boy from the age of six to sixteen uh, he, he would sort of be like a a a, a, a male uh, a, a tutor or a nanny uh, to that young boy. He was a guardian. He was to be a guide and a custodian. Some have listed him as a male nursemaid. Uh, Pythagogos is the word in the Greek, but, but, but it, the purpose was this person would uh, escort them to school and to look after them, to take care of them in the home, to do the scolding if scolding was necessary. Or then again, like some of you that got carried out to the woodshed, to give them a spanking if it was necessary. Whatever correction was needed and necessary, this guardian or guide or tutor uh, would take over. And so in the Jewish household, they knew and understood about one who was a tutor or a schoolmaster, one who helped you to know and to do the right thing. And the purpose of it was so that we may be justified by faith. The purpose ultimately was to grow that young man up to maturity in the time of adulthood. And he was ever looking forward to getting out from under that tutor because some of them, some of them by George were tough. Some of them were very much disciplinarians. Some of them absolutely strictly made you toe the line. You can just imagine a young fellow was pleased to have that close personal friend and guide and tutor and custodian of his well-being <laughs> at that early age. And no doubt they developed a close kinship and love and fellowship with one another. But on the other hand, as he matured, he was getting well ready to leave that fellow behind and go and do his own thing and go and be mature on his own. And so this was going on, this escort. Uh, it, 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 
trained him and helped him to know how to keep his life and how to keep the external matters in life, to uh, uh, obey the standards that were in life, to follow the rituals. And there came a time, though, when it was time for uh, a, a, a giving over of the external controls to the time when the young boy had matured and there was an internal control that was taken over and taken place so that he could know and choose to do the right thing. Well, the truth of the matter for the believer is for you to be justified by faith. When, when Jesus comes to be in your life, there's an internal guy. There's an internal tutor who's pointing you in the right direction and helping you to make decisions that do indeed honor the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before Christ came, there was that ritual and ceremony keeping and the sacrificial system that was so precious to the Jewish people. But all of that was designed to point you towards Christ, to point them towards faith. You see, when Christ comes, I'm out from under <laughs> being in custody as under the law. And I'm even out from under that tutor, if you will. And I'm on to a place where that in Christ I have freedom. He says that to us beginning in verse 25 when he said, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor, for you're all sons of God. Have you ever thought of yourself as being a son of God? Oh, I know that every person, every human being is a creation of God. But that's the physical creation. That's not so much what he's talking about. He's having reference here uh, to the spiritual sons of God. You see, the Judaizers wanted to hang on to the ceremonial law. They wanted to hang on to the rituals and just add Jesus to that. So even after making a profession of faith in Christ, they still hung on to those things. They wanted to add Christ to, to their works and remain under the tutor for their salvation. But Jesus Christ has come into my heart. And he's come into my life as Savior and Lord. But, you know, he didn't knock the door down. I asked him to come in. I came to that place. And all along the way, as I've grown in my understanding of who he is and what he's like and what he wants from me, I'm forever more reminded that he has a standard of righteousness that is well beyond what I've initially understood. And he's called forth for different areas of my life to come under his lordship. And as I've grown in my understanding of who he is and what he's like and what he wants me to be like, I've had to humble myself again and again and say, Lord, I don't handle this area of life so good. Would you take over this? <laughs> Let me be more fully and effectively focused on you. You see, Ephesians 2.10 says, that I now have the power of the Holy Spirit living in me to give me the power to live up to the standards and the principles that are laid out in God's word. Philippians 2 says the same thing in verse 13 when it says that the Holy Spirit in me is the power and the motivation to want to work for his good pleasure. Work for my salvation? No. Work to please him. Work to do what honors him. All my life, as long as I can remember, I've wanted to work to please my earthly father, my daddy, Bo Jenkins. I consider him one of the finest men that I know, if not the finest. And I'll tell you, it has always mattered to me what he thinks of me. And even to this day, to have my daddy's approval <laughs> is precious. But I tell you, I'm growing in a similar fashion to understand and to desire my heavenly father's approval. What does he want me to be? Who does he want me to be like? Well, like his son, Jesus, that's who, as a son of God, that's exactly what he's expecting of me. You see, I am indeed a creation of God, but I'm to be 
uh, redeemed by God, and I have been. Uh, <laughs> at the age of 17, praise God, he bought me back. He bought me off the penalty. He bought me off the uh, slave block to sin, and I, I'm becoming different. You see, when in the old days, uh, Romans 5.10 says that the enemies of God live apart from faith. Now, I didn't think of myself as an enemy of God, but it really doesn't matter. My thinking was off as well as my doing was off. He says that I was an enemy to him. John 8, 44, we just went through that on Wednesday nights. Just a short time back teaches us that every unbeliever is a child of the devil. I didn't think of myself in those terms. It matters not how I thought about it. God has communicated through Paul and through John that that was the way it was. And uh, I had a need uh, to connect to the Father by way of faith in Jesus Christ, by placing my faith in him alone. You see, I heard those testimonies being given by the youth at First Baptist. I heard the likes of Rusty Rickson and Lawana Langford telling about their surrendered hearts to Jesus, how that they had had a problem with sin and Christ paid for that at the cross and the penalty was paid. What remained was for them to invite him to take over and they did. They were different, I'm here to tell you. I became different too on April 7th, 1974. I never want to go back. Oh, there are times when I slip. There are times when I outright fall. I want to tell you, God doesn't throw me away. He picks me up. He washes me off. He washes me and cleans me fresh and new. Now, Jesus never have to go back to the cross. But there are times again and again, I find I need to take a bath, sometimes even before Saturday. Now, let me tell you, I got up and I worked in my yard all day and I was tuckered out and beat, but I wasn't just tuckered out and beat. <laughs> I had the nastiness from the yard all over me. I brushed it off outside as good as I could, but I hit the shower right quick. I felt like a new man. I want to tell you, I became a new man and the old things are to be passed away. Behold, all things are to become new. <laughs> And the newness hadn't worn off yet. In fact, it's still being added to as God does a finishing work in my life. And the one who's the author is also going to be the finisher. Paul said, I'm confident of this one thing, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Not only did I become a, God, a son of God at the age of 17 by being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, I'm becoming more and more uh, a, a son of God in my uh, performance, in my behavior, in my holiness of living. He said, as many as received him, that as received Christ, he gave the right to become children of God. Say. Have you become a child of God? Are you indeed a redeemed son of God? If you are, <laughs> well then, praise God, say so. Give evidence of it in how you live. Give evidence of it in how you speak and what you say with those lips of yours. And not only that does he say we're sons of God, he says that we're one with other Christians. Are you recognizing that we're brothers and sisters in Christ? Jews were not better than others around them. They had a problem with certain attitudes. And, and, and uh, But the scripture says there in verse 28, they were neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. He's saying what he's all he's saying is there's no distinction or value based on what race you are, or whether you're slave or you're free, whether you were rich or you were poor, whether you were male or female, there's a oneness with other Christians. 
Acts 10.35 records where that Peter finally understood this, and he gets it right. He says, in every nation, I now understand that the man who fears God and does what is right is welcome to him. Have you been welcomed to him by the presence of the Holy Spirit in you by invitation and salvation? And <laughs> as a result of him being in you, you're getting it right. I want to tell you that's what God wants from you and I is that we be one with others. Now, we don't look at others as being of a different race and somehow worth uh, less than we are. The Jews had that struggle and that problem. What I want to tell you, <laughs> in the eyes of Christ and together as brothers and sisters Christ, we're one with other Christians. Wow. And we're heirs of the promise. That is the spiritual promise of eternal salvation if you belong to Christ. Well, do you? Have you given yourself to Christ? Has he knocked on the door of your heart and you've invited him to come in? And because you invited him as a perfect gentleman, he came right on in and he says, I sup with you. I have fellowship with you. <laughs> and you have that same fellowship with one another. I tell you, Moses' law helped us to see our sin. Jesus, on the other hand, by the gift of faith, it sended grace to us <laughs> in that we couldn't keep that law, but he did. He kept it fully. And now by his presence of the Holy Spirit in us, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of truth, so can we. So can we to the glory of God. Wow. We've been blessed by this free offer of salvation in Jesus. We've been made sons of God. We've been set free. <laughs> We're one with other Christians as sons of God, and we're heirs of the promise. I don't know about you, but I like what Paul has to say in these verses. Now, let me say to you, if you've never given your heart to Christ, if you've never asked his forgiveness, you've not humbled yourself, You've not admitted, I have a problem with sin. And ask Jesus to forgive you. Ask Jesus to wash you clean. Now, when I got out of the shower last night after working in the yard all day, I was clean. I felt like a new man. Spiritually, I became a new man when I asked Jesus to forgive me and to take over and to take me to heaven when I should die. If you're in that place and you want to be washed clean, ask Jesus during this moment of prayer, Lord Jesus, we come before you, those of us as believers, thanking you and praising you that you showed us our need. You showed us our shortcomings, our failure, that we were like all. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of that sin was death. But praise you, the free gift was eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, set that lost one, that one who's not humbled himself and asked your forgiveness. Give them the gift of faith today. Enable them to receive what you did for them at the cross and invite you to take over to be their Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you have a heart to pray a prayer like that, praise Him and ask Him in prayer to take over. And He will. He'll be your Savior. He'll be your Lord. He'll be your guide all the way to glory. Have a wonderful, blessed day. Amen.